this morning we'll just continue with what we started two Sabbaths ago, and uh, the sermon title is the, it's part three of Jesus, the 2020 vision of God, and how important Jesus is for us to get a, a, a proper understanding of who God is. So when Jesus, and I'll recap uh, a bit of uh, what we had looked at. So when Jesus in Matthew uh, 5.18 uh, stated, Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. So what, when Jesus was making uh, this uh, statement, blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. And we had looked at the word pure, that p word pure in the Greek was katharos, which also means the same Greek word also means clean. So keep that in mind. It, the Greek word means pure, and also that same word means clean. And we will see why it is so important that we understand that the word pure in the Greek also meant clean. So we could read, blessed are the clean in heart, for they shall see God. And like I say, we'll explain this in more detail as we move along. Is Jesus referring to seeing God literally, or is he referring to knowing God spiritually? So when Jesus made the statement, blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God, what was he trying to communicate? <clears throat> God was seen literally, and I'm not going to cover all in the scriptures that people had seen God literally. We'll just look at a few passages to make sure that we're on track as to where we are going. So, so when Jesus was saying, blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God, uh, we will look at some where the, the literal <coughs> application uh, fell into place. So but the first one will be Genesis 18 and verse 33. So the Lord went his way as soon as he had finished speaking with Abraham, and Abraham returned to his place. And the next passage we're going to look at is uh, verse 32, I mean chapter 32, verse 30. So Jacob, Jacob called the name of the place Peniel, for I have seen God face to face, and my life is preserved. And then the next one is uh, Exodus chapter 24 and verse 10. <clears throat> and they saw the God of Israel, and there was under his feet, as it were, a paved work of sapphire stone, and it was like the very heavens in its clarity. And the next one now we're going to look at is chapter 33, Exodus 33 and verse 11. Exodus chapter 33 and verse 11. So the Lord spoke to Moses face to face as a man speaks to his friend. And he would return to the camp, but his servant Joshua, the son of Nun, a young man, did not depart from the tabernacle. So here again, so the Lord spoke to Moses face to face as a man speaks to a friend. And the last one we're going to look at, and like I say, there's so many other passages we could have gone to, but <clears throat> we're trying to confine it just to a few. And the next one will be Numbers chapter uh, 12 and verse 8. Numbers chapter 12 and verse 8. And this is God speaking concerning Moses. I speak with him face to face, even plainly, and not in dark sayings. And he sees the form of the Lord. Why then were you not afraid to speak against my servant Moses? So here again, God clearly said, I speak with him, with Moses, face to face, even plainly, and not in dark sayings. Now, with that settled, and, and very clearly, we see that God did speak to human beings, so when Jesus made that statement again, blessed are the pure in spirit, they will see God. I want us now to turn to John chapter 1. John chapter 1, and we're going to look at verses 16 to verse 18. John chapter 1, 
verses 16 to verse 18. And of his fullness we have all received, and grace for grace. So here now I want us to pay particular attention to the word here of fullness. For clearly, for all of his fullness we have all received, and grace for grace. And that word, Greek word again is pletor, which means to say in its totality, in full. So of his fullness, John is writing concerning Jesus, we have all received and grace for grace. For the law was given through Moses, but grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. Now here again in verse 17, something very important John has stated. He's telling us, for the law was given through Moses, and that word but is a, is a add-on there, it's not in the original. So I'll read it. For the law was given through Moses, grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. That is extremely important what has been stated there. Now, look at verse 18. No one has seen God at any time. The only begotten Son who is in the bosom of the Father, he has declared him. So what is John stating here? We just read all those verses where people had seen God face to face, spoke to God face to face. So what is John stating here? Again, when Jesus said, blessed are the pure in heart for they shall see God, he is talking of us coming to know God the way God should be known. Very clear that we cannot know God the way God should be known outside of the person of Jesus Christ. So when in verse 18, for no one has seen God at any time, what John is telling us, no one, no one understood God's character of agape love the way it was supposed to be understood until the person of Jesus Christ came, the only begotten Son, who is in the bosom of the Father, he has declared him, which means to say, nobody came to this earth and had that title, that he came forth from the bosom of the Father, which means to say that nobody else could give us that complete and total revelation of God's character outside of the person of Jesus Christ. With that in mind, look at Colossians 1, 19. Again, looking at Jesus being, having that fullness. For it pleased the Father that in him, in Jesus Christ, all the fullness should dwell. So again, the Apostle Paul is telling us that in the person of Jesus Christ, the totality, the complete fullness of God is in the person of Jesus Christ. This is why the whole world, I believe, needs this revelation of Jesus Christ about God. More so, anybody else that needs this is we Christians. And tragically, most Christians, tragically, most Christians claim to be Christians, claim to be followers of Jesus Christ, but they have relegated him in a back burner instead of him being foremost in giving us the true revelation of God. With that in mind, look at John chapter 6. John chapter 6 and verse uh, 46. Not that anyone has seen the Father, except he who is from God, he has seen, has seen the Father. Again, Jesus is trying to tell us exactly what we have discussed so far. That not that anyone has seen the Father. Well, we just read how many different people had seen God. And like I say, we only took a sample of it. So what Jesus is saying again, not anyone has seen the Father, which means to say not anyone has known God character the way God's character should be known. No one except he who is from God, he has seen the Father, which means to say nobody can give us that pure, 
unadulterated, clean revelation of God's character of love, of agape love, except for the person of Jesus Christ. Note what Jesus had said to Philip. Note this, what he said to Philip. He who has seen me has seen the Father. There it is, Jesus himself saying, he who has seen me has seen the Father. If you and I accept all of Jesus' revelation of God, blessed are the pure in heart, for we shall see God. That pure of heart, that cleansing of our heart cannot happen, cannot happen outside of Jesus Christ's revelation. And when we accept Jesus Christ's revelation, when we accept that and go along with what Jesus has taught, we end up with a pure heart and we see God the way God should be seen. We know God the way God should be known. And once again, the person of Jesus Christ has done that for us. Now, we started off with stating very clearly that Jesus said, Verse the pure in heart, that Greek word was kathoros, also means clean. And we are going somewhere here with this that is extremely, extremely important. So when Jesus again states in, in John chapter 15, verse 3, pay particular attention to what he's saying here. You are already clean because of the word which I have spoken to you. So what Jesus is telling here, he's talking to his disciples and he's telling them, you are already clean. Why? How are they already clean? Because of the word which I have spoken to you. So which means to say they are a pure heart. That same Greek word here that is used for clean is the same Greek word that was used for blessed are the pure in heart. So Jesus is telling them the reason you are having this clean heart or pure understanding is because I have spoken to you. Now we're going to look at the, uh, in, in detail here certain things that are involved, but keep this in mind. If we miss this important point, we'll miss the whole uh, study that we've gone through for these last three Sabbaths. Next one I want us to look at is John chapter 13 and verse 10. Now in this case, we have to keep in mind uh, what the King James Version uh, states in John chapter uh, 13 and verse 10. Jesus said to him, He that is washed needs not save to wash his feet. Okay, so but is, go ahead. But is clean every whit. And you are clean, but not all. Okay, so I'm going to again read the same verse. He who is washed needs only to wash his feet, but is completely clean, and you are clean, but not all of you. So here there's two Greek words that he's used, and I'm not going to go into all the details, but for that first word here, he who is washed, is a Greek word that means you are completely and totally bathed. You are completely and totally washed. The second Greek word here, when it says, he who is washed needs only to wash his feet. That's a different Greek word used for that second washing. In that second washing, the only thing that needs to be washed is our feet. That's what Jesus is talking of here. So when he said, in that first washing, he who is washed needs only to wash his feet, but is completely clean. I hope you are getting this. So what it's saying is that that first washing from Jesus, he who is washed needs only to wash his feet. He who has been washed or cleansed or made pure of any lies that they had believed about God, Jesus Christ is the only one that can wash that 
That means the whole body is washed except for the feet. And we'll see why Jesus stated, except clean and you are, uh, I mean, sorry, only to wash his feet. Now, the foot, usually they would bathe, then when they would uh, go anywhere, their feet would get dirty. Now, I want us to pay attention to this. The, the context, if we will look at the context, we'll see this. The foot needs to be washed, but the body has been completely and totally made clean. So the reason, the f and we'll see how this applies here. The reason the foot needs to be washed, needless to say, it applies physically, literally, but there's a spiritual application here also. Especially when we will look at where we are going, that we are washed by Jesus, and when we accept all of Jesus' revelation, all of Jesus' teachings, we have been completely and totally washed. But the feet still needs to be cleansed. What does that mean? That as we walk our spiritual walk, as we walk the spiritual life of ours, should we fall? Should we fail? Should we sin? All that needs to be washed is our feet. You see what I'm trying to get through here? That all that needs to be washed is wherever we have fallen. As long as we have allowed Jesus to purify our minds, to clean our minds, to wash us completely so that we have a correct understanding of God. So here again I read it. He who is washed needs only to wash his feet, but is completely clean. And you are clean, but not all of you. Remember we read in uh, John 15, 3, you are already clean because of the words which I have spoken to you. So someone here, Jesus says, but not all of you are clean. And the reason this person is not clean, we're going to see why. With that, Let's turn now to Luke chapter 22, verses 24 to 27. Luke chapter 22, verses 24 to 27. <clears throat> now there was also a dispute among them as to which of them should be considered the greatest. And he said to them, The kings of the Gentiles exercise lordship over them. And those who exercise authority over them are called benefactors. But not so among you. On the contrary, he who is greatest among you, let him be as the younger, and he who governs as he who serves. For who is greater, he who sits at the table or he who serves? Is it not he who sits at the table? Yet I am among you as one who serves. Can you grasp what Jesus has stated here? Think of it. Now there was a dispute among them, among the disciples, as to which of them should be considered the greatest. The greatest. And he said to them, the kings of the Gentiles exercise lordship over them. When he's saying the kings of the Gentiles, which means to say everybody that is governed by the tree of the knowledge of good and evil and have not understood the tree of life principle, they are looking always to hold supremacy, to be proud, to have self-exaltation. And the worst, dear ones, the worst kind of people that are proudful are the ones that are church-going people, and they think that they have it all, and what do they do? They start looking down on other people, criticizing other people, criticizing their belief. Why? Because they have no concept of God's agape love. They have abjectly failed in getting that knowledge, that truth, 
from the person of Jesus Christ so that they can live differently to what Gentiles do. So here, the kings of the Gentiles exercise authority over them, and those who exercise authority over them are called benefactors. But not so among you. That's what Jesus is saying. Such mindset should not be among Christians, but not so among you. On the contrary, he who is the greatest, he who is the greatest among you, let him be as the younger, and he who governs as he who serves. And we're going to look at the profoundness of what Jesus is talking of here. What it means to serve, whether you are holding a leadership position or whatever mindset you might have where you think or I think that I or you are so above everybody else that we look down and treat them in a demeaning way. That is not God's agape love, dear ones. And that's why to know and to be cleansed of all kinds of lies about God's character is so, so important. And the only person that can do that for us is the person of Jesus Christ. And give us that pure mind so that we can see God for who he is. For who, for who is greater, he who sits at the table or he who serves? Is it not he who sits at the table? Yet, note what Jesus said, yet I am among you as one who serves. From the depth of that statement of Jesus, dear ones, why could Jesus make such a statement? How could he make such a statement that he comes and what does he do? He only serves. He's a true servant. Why? Because he was giving us a revelation of God that he had that agape love that he, even as the Son of God, as God in, in, in his incarnate form, he came to reveal to us what God is like. And I know it's tough for us to believe this, that the God of the universe is not the way Satan wants us to believe and think. And we use the scriptures to try and prove that point. Jesus revealed to us exactly what God is like. He came to serve. And in that service, he is revealing what God is like. Next passage I want us now to go back to. We, we looked at John chapter 13 and verse 10. Now I want us to try and cover something that is very important in John chapter 13. And we will start from verse 1 of John chapter 13. And extremely important, dear ones, as to what is involved here. With all what we have discussed, now we are going to look at John chapter 13 from verse 1. Now, before the feast of the Passover, when Jesus knew that his hour had come, that he should depart from this world to the Father, having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. And supper being ended, the devil having already put it into the heart of Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, to betray him. Now, pay particular attention to verse 2. <clears throat> and supper being ended, the devil... The devil, having already put into the heart of Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, to betray him. So this was something that was in Judas Iscariot even before this period. And we will see why after this event we are clearly told that he makes his move and goes and betrays Jesus. And we will see why he ended up doing this. Jesus, knowing that the Father had given... 
uh, had given all things into his hands and that he had, he had come from God and was going to God, rose from supper and laid aside his garments, took a towel and girded himself. So what, what Paul, I mean, John is trying to tell us very important information here in verse 3. Jesus knowing that the Father had given all things into his hand and that he had come from God and was going to God. Very clear. He came from God and was going to God, rose from supper, laid aside his garments, took a towel, and girded himself. After that, he poured water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with the towel with which he was girded. So here, this word wash again is the Greek word that means only a certain part of the body needs to be washed. The rest is all clean. Then he came to Simon Peter, and Peter said to him, Lord, are you washing my feet? Jesus answered and said to him, What I am doing to you do not understand now, but you will, not, but you will know after this. Well, what here we will see what Jesus meant, that what I am doing you do not understand now, but you will know after this. Because right here we will see what, it, what Jesus meant, that you will know after this. Peter said to him, You shall never wash my feet. Jesus answered him, If I do not wash you, you have no part with me. So, look at what Jesus tells Peter. You sh when Peter says, You shall never wash my feet, Jesus answered him, If I do not wash your feet, if I do not wash you, you have no part with me. So here, what Jesus is trying to tell Peter, what he's going to do is wash the feet. So what Peter is thinking, uh-uh-uh, you never, that's the word, you are never going to wash my feet. Impossible. Why? Because as the Messiah, this is not the work of the Messiah, this is not the role of the Messiah, the Messiah can never be washing anybody's feet. And then what Jesus tells him, if I do not wash you, you have no part with me. Which means to say that if Peter was going to hold on to this erroneous view and thinking of the Messiah the wrong way, he has no part with Jesus. He is not going to get the understanding that he's supposed to receive except as he hangs in there with Jesus, as he st sticks by Jesus, as he walks by Jesus, even though he might still have some problems understanding all what he should understand. But we'll see. Peter and the others, what did they do? They hung in there with Jesus. They hadn't, didn't understand everything. And we know they didn't. They were trying to be what? Great and arguing among who's going to be the greatest, who's going to be sitting on the right side and on the left side of Jesus, thinking with that mind of being great. So they still had this problem. But what is Jesus showing? They had this problem, but not like Judas. These leaven hung in there with Jesus even though they did not have that complete understanding. They did not let go of the person of Jesus Christ. And dear ones, this applies to us. This applies to us. If we might not understand everything, we might not have every doctrine in place, but if we, with our whole heart, mind, and soul, hunger and thirst for righteousness, which is Jesus Christ's righteousness, His revelation of God. If our heart and mind, in purity, with no agenda, except that pure heart of wanting to know God through Jesus, and we hang in there with Him, the promise is that we will see God the way we're supposed to see God. 
So Peter said, if I, um, Jesus said, if I do not wash you, you have no part with me. Simon Peter said to him, Lord, not my feet only, but also my hands and my head. So Peter got it, you see? And this is how he said, look, Lord, this is so, so important. You are so important for me. Not only my feet, but all of me. See, that's how a mind we should have. Jesus, I don't understand everything. I don't have all the knowledge I'll want. I still wrestle with things in the scriptures, but I am hanging there with you. I am not going to let go of you. I will hold on to you irrespective of whatever happens. Why? Because you are the only one that has the words of eternal life. No one else has that word of eternal life. Verse 10. And Jesus said to him, He who is bathed needs only to wash his feet, but is completely clean. And you are clean, but not all of you. See, here we're going again to Judas. All the eleven, you are clean, but they weren't. Did they have that complete knowledge of all Jesus was trying to teach them? Of course they didn't. They were still wrestling with issues. But Jesus turned around and said, You are clean, but not all of you. And why? Why did Jesus say this about uh, Judas? Just because he was going to betray him? No, dear ones. Judas had a mindset when he joined Jesus. He knew this is the Messiah. Of course he did. But what did he want? He wanted a worldly Messiah. He wanted a Messiah that belonged to the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. He didn't want a Messiah that belonged to the tree of life. And eventually, through this event, as Jesus did all what he did, he's looking at Jesus and he's thinking in his mind, if this guy is really the Messiah, there's something seriously wrong. He is washing the feet of all of us. This is not the work of the Messiah. This is not the God that I know. And that eventually led him to where he did. And Jesus said, but not all of you. For he knew who would betray him. Therefore he said, you are not all clean. Again, why? Because of the kind of mind Judas had. And dear ones, as important as the, this foot washing this, uh, event is important, we must grasp the spiritual significance of what was involved. This one. So when he had washed their feet, taken his garments, and sat down again, he said to them, Do you know what I have done to you? You call me teacher and Lord, and you say, Well, for so I am. If I then, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. So look at very carefully in verse 13. What Jesus says, you call me, you, the disciples, you call me teacher and Lord. And you say, well, for so I am. But look at what he does in verse 14. He turns it around. In verse 14, he says, if I then your Lord and teacher, they said, what? Teacher and Lord. Jesus removes what they said. He goes in and says, Lord and teacher. And what does he mean there? If I then, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, I, the Lord of the universe, I, the Lord of the universe, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. Which means to say, every one of us must have this mind that Jesus wants all of us to have. This humble, loving, agape loving mind. If not, dear ones, we can profess Christianity, we can come to church, we can keep the right day, we can do whatever we are doing. 
Tragically, we are no different to Judas. Sorry, that's exactly what this message is here for. We must hang in there with the person of Jesus Christ and get our minds cleansed of everything that we have believed that is, has not been of God. For I have given you an example that you should do as I have done to you. Most assuredly, I say to you, a servant is not greater than his master, nor is he who is sent greater than he who sent him. If you know these things, blessed are you if you do them. See, so here in verse 17, once you come to know these things, and if you live it this way, and if you do these things, just don't do this external foot washing service, but make sure that you understand the deep spiritual significance of what is involved. So when anyone holds a leadership position in the church, they better make sure that they got the mind of Jesus Christ. Nothing else. Otherwise, they're on the wrong path. I want us to close with 2 Corinthians, and we'll see something here that I believe can apply to Judas. Okay, 2 Corinthians chapter 4, 2 Corinthians chapter 4, and we, we are going to look at verse 4 to verse 6. Now keep this in mind. I believe, even though Paul is addressing people that have not understood the Old Testament in the light of Jesus Christ, the veil has not been taken away in their understanding of the Old Testament except through the person of Jesus Christ. That's what the context is about. But mm -hmm. I <clears throat> believe that what is being addressed here is a person like Judas. And, and this is what it is. And there is one word here that does tie this with Judas because Judas, Judas Jesus called him the son of perdition. And, and if you look at verse 3, but even if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing. And it's the same word. Whose minds the God of this age has blinded, who do not believe, lest the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine on them. So, so clear Paul is stating, whose mind the God of this age, that's the devil, has blinded, who do not believe, lest the light of the gospel of the glory of who? Of Christ, who is the image of God, should sign on them. For we do not preach ourselves, but Christ Jesus the Lord, and ourselves your bond servants for Jesus' sake. With this, I'm going to uh, look at this last verse here that we've just read. For we do not preach ourselves, Paul is saying, He's not elevating himself. We do not preach ourselves, but Christ Jesus, the Lord. That's all Paul is focused on. I determine not to know anything among you, save Jesus Christ and him crucified. And ourselves, your born servants, for Jesus' sake. In the King James, he just uses the word servants. I like my... Uh, New King James translation because it gives a deeper emphasis of this word bond servant. The word is doulos. Bond servant means someone that is doing this work voluntarily. He's a bond servant. He's a servant. He's a slave of Jesus Christ, but he's doing it voluntarily. He's not a slave that has been made a slave but a voluntary slave, a voluntary mind to elevate only person is Jesus and puts himself down. With this, let's close with John chapter 6. Extremely important to look at what we're going to look at now. John chapter 6. And we're going to start. If I had my way and we had all the time to do this, I would have gone with more verses, but we'll confine it right now from verse 60 of John chapter 6. These were people that had eaten of the loaves and fishes, and Jesus had told them, 
I am the true bread from heaven. He who eats my flesh and drinks my blood has everlasting life. Which means to say when Jesus made those eat my flesh and drink my blood, that we must feed ourselves with nobody else but the person of Jesus Christ. And do you know, the majority rejected that. The majority did not want Jesus Christ to be their all-consuming passion. They did not want Jesus Christ to be the ultimate revelation of God. They wanted somebody else. And here we see what's going to end up happening. Therefore, many of his disciples, when they heard this, said, This is a hard saying. Who can understand it? When Jesus knew in himself that his disciples complained about this, he said to them, Does this offend you? What then if you should see the Son of Man ascend where he was before? It is the Spirit who gives life. The flesh profits nothing. The words that I speak to you are spirit and they are life. Now the word life here means spiritual life. That only Jesus Christ can feed us and give us that spiritual life. Nobody else. But there are some of you who do not believe. For Jesus knew from the beginning who they were who did not believe and who would betray him. And he said, Therefore I have said to you that no one can come to me unless it has been granted to him by my Father. From that time, many of his disciples went back and walked with him no more. Then Jesus said to the twelve, Do you also want to go away? So pay attention to what happens here. But Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. There it is. There it is, dear ones, for us. Who can we go to? No one else but the person of Jesus Christ. Why? Because he has got the truth, he's got the message of eternal life, and no one else. Also, we have come to believe and know that you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. That you are the true Messiah, the Son of the living God. Jesus answered them, Did I not choose you, the twelve? And one of you is a devil. And he spoke of Judas Iscariot, the son of Simon, for it was he who would betray him, being one of the twelve. So my prayer, a really sincere, my prayer for all of us, that we will come to the realization that if we really and truly want to see God and know God, we cannot know God, we will never be able to understand God except as Jesus Christ is going to reveal it to us. All of us, bar none, every one of us, every human being needs that cleansing from the person of Jesus Christ to come to know God the way he should be known. And my prayer, like I say, for all of us, for the world, is that they will come to know Jesus because in him is life eternal.